Each of us carries a mask, which is a face. It creates a disturbance in all before us and provides shelter from the tides, which will eventually wash us away. Images remain in photographs, in glimpses of repeated memory. Faces emerge from darkness. One after the other and I watch their eyes. That's not me, I say. That's not me. That's not me. These people are all gone now. They may as well be me. I think there is a small part of history, which for me, is completely internal. Events which have not happened to me in my own lifetime, or for which there is any remaining evidence in actual fact, but which emerge from my quiet mind like dreams from thin air. Events which collect and form a reality more vivid than life. I find myself thinking of a time when civilized people lived their daily lives on the edge of wilderness. Centuries of determination had finally brought nature under their mastery. The natives had been conquered. The Miwok, the Paiute, the Hoopa, the Yahi, all the tribes and shamanistic traditions of my region had vanished. All the dances of the eagle, the coyote, Yatahe, Kuksu, all fell silent. A great and bloody war had been fought and won in a place far away. 
and people stepped up from the earth into automobiles, looked up from their books and correspondence to telephone lines and flickering motion pictures, thus learning to leave their body. And the submission of nature to man's diligent mastery was the triumph that made it all possible. I think this must be when my own fate was sealed, long before I was born, when reason became the measure of human life, and dreams like mine began their long exile which continues even tonight. That's not me. That's not me. Might have been a child. I might have been two children. Yes. I charge ahead into some internal wilderness, and I shudder helplessly through shock after shock as though being led by another being. Look at his eyes, Edward. What do you see? He seems nervous, glancing around as if he's being attacked. Do the eyes move together? I can't tell. Let me see. Yes, they seem to be moving together. Go on, then. Don't hesitate. What are you, Mr. Crouch? Nothing you ever seen before. Are you animal or mineral? I'm the axe in your head, Doc. How many legs do you have? Mm, you want to get between them all, eh, doctor? Uh, you're the crazy one, little brother! Attention, Edward. Here, find him up and take him to the laboratory. Madness is a beast, Edward, and you've let him get the best of you. Will you go white with fear again next time? I don't know what came over me. This is a wilderness, and our strength is in reason. Never forget it. Tame the beast, or you are lost. Prepare these reports. You are behind schedule. Yes, sir. Edward? We bring the clarity of order. Do not expect sentimental gratitude. Like a tree which grows between impossible cracks in a rocky surface, the reasonable man toughens the fibers which hold him aloft, distortions which twist his nature around to accommodate his impenetrable surroundings, distortions which ultimately shape his fate, which determine the final heights to which his heart may soar and even the hour of his death. Edward was that kind of crusader. He had given over his being to the higher forces of his intellectual will. This is, of course, what he expected from Caroline and Gina, the daughters of his dead brother, Philip. Florence, their mother, had died when Gina was born and Philip was killed in the Great War. It fell on Edward to raise the girls alone from that point on, 
which he did with heroic steadiness and efficiency. Enough of that. And so, now, finally, we can move on to the subject of good social behavior. Your father was a respected man, very dear to me as a brother, well known in town and as far as New York. What does this mean? Let us contemplate. What does it mean to be the daughters of a respected man? Gina, perhaps you could shed some light on this for us. It is our responsibility to behave morally in all aspects of our social life. True enough. But then, is that to say that our responsibilities end when we retire at the end of the day? Caroline, perhaps you can help illuminate this for us. Do you mean when we're alone? Yes. At the end of the day? Yes. Asleep or awake? Asleep or awake. Well, then, one has a responsibility only to oneself. Let us take the example of a man who takes it upon himself to invent stories of a perverse and corrupting nature. What then? He may be in his rooms alone at night, but he commits a social crime. But asleep as well? I must admit, it is difficult to discover where one's conscience lies when one dreams. It's one of the important questions we're trying to solve at the new university clinic. All my research points to a rather dense mystery. I remember a dream I had about a month ago. I was in a strange house, an old one, abandoned, fallen into disuse. I remember a feeling as if I'd lost my way. One vacant room led to another. And I'd forgotten from which way I'd come. Philip, my brother, your father. Philip, can you remember me? Did he say anything? That's all. A silly dream. Sheerest nonsense. So you see, one needn't be obliged to account for what one dreams as if it were something of one's own making. What if we're living in a dream, one that's not of our own making? Then we wouldn't really exist, would we? And I don't think that's a state of affairs that would please any of us. How about you, Gina? Would you like to live in a dream, full of fairies and will-o'-the-wisps and such? We can't live in our dreams. Of course not. I've polished them for you, Caroline. The bath nearly melted me away.
I flew up and I had the moon inside me. My shadow reached from west to east. A white deer bounded from the trees. It saw my shadow and lifted its head aloft. I walked higher on the roof and I heard it speak. Ow. What did it say? It said that we anticipate your arrival with great eagerness. You're silly. We must prepare ourselves with feathers and war paint. Uncle Edward has a guest. For dinner? Not Mr. Horton. I think so. We'll have to postpone our ceremony. Will the spirits wait for us? Let me see you, Gina. Your eyes are sharp. You'll make a fine coyote. Look, see how they change color? At twilight, they'll know you for a true spirit. A girl so smart and polished, they'll say. She'll be a princess soon. You're making fun of me. No, I just wish we could change things for real. These fragments appear. A strange synthesis of dream and desire. Possibilities unfold. And I am forced by some internal circumstances to acknowledge these characters as if they were friends to whom I owe specific favors. like the present. That's what old Philip would say. Your brother was quite a fellow. A shame the war took the best of him. It's in these young girls that one finds a savage spirit. My Agatha was like this once. Like a young doe. You see, Caroline had what I always lacked, a fire in my soul that could carry me headlong into another reality. Caroline has 
always been on her own in her class. Very few friends other than her sister. I'll speak frankly, Dr. Spear. Caroline is having trouble with the other girls. Forgive me for mentioning this, but I feel that I must. I've heard them refer to her as the ghost. Of course, I have always encouraged them to be friendly with her, explaining that she's very bright and that they can learn something from her. But the other night, when everyone had been put to bed and all the lights were out, she was seen on the roof of the dormitory in the throes of some wild passion, as it was described to me. She was leering and making strange sounds. And she was completely naked in the cold air. Has she been asked to explain this behavior? She said only that we were all children and that we'd all be doing such things soon. Monstrous. I can't believe it. She's always been such a studious girl. When I told her that her behavior was scandalous and that it could hurt her future seriously, she simply threw her arms around me in a most indelicate way. I'm sorry, I can't go on. You understand, don't you? Well, I trust that this ghastly story will be kept as private as can be in any case. I wouldn't do anything to hurt you, Dr. Spears. But I'm sure you can understand how ruinous it would be to the school if she were to continue these scandalous demonstrations. I'm afraid you'll have to forgive me, Miss Carter. I need to reflect on these matters alone. I'm so, so sorry, Dr. Spears. The last thing I want to do is upset you. I hope we can still be friends. Gina, Caroline, you are both of an age now when you are beginning to require the guidance of a woman. What I have to tell you is very difficult for me. Life will soon present itself in ways that are hard and it's best to be well prepared. I regret that I have only been able to provide you both with a partial upbringing. I'm sorry that you haven't been able to have this kind of feminine contact until now. I only hope that you'll be able to benefit from a belated understanding on my part. Mrs. E is a well-respected woman, of good character, and wise to the ways of youth, having worked with the young ladies in clubs for years now. Her means are substantial, and she is well-liked in society. Thank you, Edward. Carolyn, Gina, you are lovely girls. You look strong and well-mannered. Let there be no doubt that your uncle loves you dearly. And that is why, beginning next week, he has put you in my charge. Yes, it's true. You shall move in with me. No doubt you will be alarmed, and you will find before long we will be the best of friends. I'm told I have a knack for turning young women into ladies. Those who have helped remain grateful for years. You will find a new life with me, and you will see how knowledge can cleanse the spirit. There will be a new Gina and a new Caroline. I quite like the old Caroline. Gina. This is very sudden, Uncle Edward. You're both good girls, and I know why this must worry you, but rest assured everything will be fine. We'll have great fun together. Edward, I'm afraid I have an engagement with the Peabody's this afternoon, so you'll have to excuse me for running off like this.
What should we do? She says we must be on our way. I'm packing some food. We'll need food. If one pursues this path, or if one is guided through it, it is probable that one would lose all reassurance of one's identity. You will think that you are a stream or a circle of fallen feathers. You will lose everything and then you will lose yourself. Far enough tonight. W will they be coming after us? I expect they will. I'm scared. Caroline, where are we? Shh, here. I'm not lost. <gasps> Thank <laughs> you. 
What's that? An owl. Shh. He has a message. Children of the moon, traveling far, angels watch you now, angels all around, dark as the night. Sleep with us, they say. Sleep in our arms, valiant hearts. Sleep. I need to speak with you. Oscar, it's Edward. I'm afraid something terrible has happened. The girls have gone. I have no idea. No, I, I don't think so. They appear to be on their own. Yes. No, no. I don't want the police. I don't want to start any rumors. I've decided to go after them myself. Uh, they appear to have gone off into the woods. I need that fellow Murphy you were telling me about. Yeah. I, I think that if we can find their trail, we could catch up with them in a short time. Thank you, Oscar. Oscar, uh, will you come with us? Good. Okay.
Here's the first taste of freedom. more of that orange? Oh, sure. This is a good place to rest. Here. I'll be happy if we never set eyes on that school again. They're a bunch of swine. Miss Carter's a gossipy old maid with itchy bloomers. And that Eva Pentecost, I could twist her tits off. We're right from all that now. Uncle Edward will be very upset with us. Yes. I think he may be. But after a while, we'll go get him. We'll show him our new lives, and you'll see that it's all for the best. I think I would like to tell him that he has been very hard with us. What would you tell him? I would tell him that he simply has not recognized our noble nature. In the society of the great spirit, all must understand their noble nature. Noble nature? Do I have a noble nature? Yes, you do. And that's why we must find the others. Come. <laughs> to the trained eye, the wilderness was a huge collection of ever-changing evidence. Murphy led the three men through a series of discoveries. for which neither of the two were prepared.
hard to say how this experience of the great openness had its effect on Caroline and Edward. Let us say for now that it presented an almost cataclysmic opportunity of the kind that their history required. Do you think they'll be like us? Maybe. I can't imagine what they're like. I can. Ah! Good shot, Coyote. How could you? The United States Cavalry, January 1902. Bless your soul, Mr. Alouette. You've given your body back to the earth like a gentleman. Please, let's just leave it. It's a gift from Mr. Alouette. We mustn't look like cowards. What are you going to do with that? What good is it? I'll think of something. Here, come kneel before me, Coyote. Caroline, this is so creepy. Come on, this is what we've been waiting for. No one's gonna hurt us. Now come here. Kneel. By the power invested in me as a seeker of the great spirit Kuksu of the Indians, of the peoples of the wilderness, of the noble nature which surrounds us, I hereby free you to play in the sun as a sister truer than any other. No more fears, Gina. This ghostly sword will show us the direction. It's difficult to determine what constitutes a disturbance in nature. Caroline, you're going to make me crazy! Please wait for me! Limbs crack and fall from trees of their own weight. A bird may miss its migratory path and be doomed to death by weather. Sparks from falling rocks can start a fire in the summer heat and dryness but a disturbance remains a part of nature, like lightning or death. It seems the young ladies are headed out straight for the wilderness. Hmm, no one out there but a few Indians and crazy old hermits after a while. Huh, must have a hankering for open country. This is still the Wild West, gentlemen. Still home to plenty of desperate folks. see anyone, Caroline. Here there is a form born purely of necessity. Force is so opposing, locked in solid contradiction. Be perfectly still. I know they're out there somewhere. We're trapped in time, and they have broken free. I'm sure I can feel them calling us towards them. Can't you? Listen.
you think we're close? Closer than we think. It's... It's time that separates us, Gina. Here. Sit. Now close your eyes. And listen. Where is time? Well, isn't this a test of nerve? I certainly can't remember ever coming this far out. It's Caroline. She is what she is. When she was 13, I had just come back from hunting and everyone was gone. I looked out onto the terrace. She was all in white, in her mother's veils, walking around like a phantom. What is it that drives these girls mad? That girl at the school, running around in the buff. Do you suppose it's some sort of sudden rush of animal passions when they're nearing womanhood? Caroline has always been something we didn't expect. It was as though she wanted to erase everything we ever knew about her. Like she wanted always to be a stranger. Hmm, what have we here? These little surprises must be damned annoying. Might have been a deserter. He seems to have died in a natural way. Sword is missing. I put that to 20 years of passers-by. Wait. Of course, Caroline was here and took it. Take hold of yourself, man. Hmm. You're right, Doctor. Someone around here is very much alive.
yourself so I can see. Where are you? If you are anything like me, show yourself Where so are I can you? see. If you are anything you like me, me, show yourself so I can see. If I were you and you were me, what would I want to make you see? What does this tell you, Mr. Murphy? I'd say these are girls with an eye for the wonders of nature. Christ. Which way could they be heading? So far, no clear direction. They seem to be traveling every which way. We seem to be following something. Wouldn't we have seen tracks or something? It depends on what's leading them. I don't understand. Could be a map. Could be a list of directions. Could be anything. They might be following a butterfly for all we know. Butterfly? <laughs> Yeah, butterfly. It could be anything, Doctor. Well, Edward, I guess we're chasing wild geese. But what can be said about the moments when I feel a beastly fear which drifts across the land before me? Or when I suddenly can sense some kind of familiar creature dancing behind my back that's gone when I turn to see. I ignore these things. But Caroline pursued these gaps in time. And others were drawn in with her. And their lives were permanently transformed. What do you see, Caroline? Caroline! Here's the secret to dining well, my friends. Oscar, there isn't any time for this. We could have a short rest. We've been gaming on them. It's late. You could use it, Doctor, if you don't mind me saying. I suppose I could use a rest. How was a moment born? How is it plucked from the flow of time? How do these shadows seem to contain a presence? deep and vast. How do visions reveal truth?
except through the eyes of a witness. Forgive me. No one believes me if I don't show them a picture. Ambrose O'Keefe. I'm Caroline, and this is my sister, Coyote. Caroline. My very great pleasure. I'm Gina. This is great country, isn't it? Ah, let me show you something. Look, what do you suppose that is? This is the Sierra just east of here. It's a land of spirits. That's right, Caroline. That's just what it is. That's why no one believes me if I don't show them a picture. This should give me the strength I need. It's the hunting that gives one strength. Am I right, Murphy? It's hard to see what strength is in the eyes of nature. My old Indian friend, Billy Crow, says that strength is why a spirit takes you in her arms for protection. That's why it's such a great honor. These Indians, these desperate people, would they hurt the girls? Well, most likely not. No. It's my understanding that they'd rather skin a squirrel, if you take my meaning. I'm afraid that Caroline might go to them for reasons that are wild. I, I mean, do you think their sense of decency would be strong enough to protect her from herself? You see, Doctor, these Indians, and I haven't said for sure if there are any around here, they're not of one even stock. You can see me. How alike am I to Mr. Horton? Hmm. Huh? Every one of them's a single soul against the wilderness, tribe or no. And you may ask yourself, sir, aren't we all? What brings you so far into this wilderness, Caroline? There are some magic people out there. I've seen people doing strange things. But being as I am, shall we say, prone to misfortune, I try to keep my distance. I have to see something that'll make it all clear. I'll keep my distance just the same. You don't believe me, and I wish I had a picture to show you. But if you see them, you'll understand. There's a story I heard once about this place. It's a story of spirits. Surely you don't believe in spirits, Mr. Murphy. Well, there's more in heaven and earth than we know or believe, Doctor. It seems a brother from the old mission came up here to die. Tired of his loneliness and tired of the world. A dear spirit came and gave him water. He drank without thinking. A young bear came and left a freshly killed rabbit at his feet. 
It can't be explained. He took heart and cooked and ate, and after his meal, the lark sang him so sweet a song that he chose life. He began a great project, which lasted 40 years. He gathered seeds, and he planted trees. And these oaks around us are said to be his work. What happened to the brother? Needless to say, the brother got up and went on his way. As the story goes, he left the brotherhood. He took a wife and became a farmer. It's your daughter. You'll never let go of me, will you? Let go of me, Edward. I hated having to be sane for you. It's all the same now, and I need to move on. Now is your time, Edward. You're the one that's free.
I think this part is the most exhilarating. Uh. It feels good to leap, Oscar. You should try it. It's good for the calves. Coyote, look. Wow. How utterly disarming. I don't see the humor in this, Edward. I'll box your ears. This was my finest piece. Oscar. My finest piece. Hi ho, gentlemen. There's a house up here. Mrs. E. Carolyn. Good heavens. Gina, how splendid. Edward must have forgotten to call ahead, but this is splendid all the same. Come. How about some lemonade? I'm sure you're thirsty. Eloise? Gina, come on. All right. Eloise? I want you to meet Eloise. She manages our collections. Elwaz, do be a dear and fix some lemonade for our guests. Yes, Mrs. E. These two pieces were bundled with Elwaz when she was brought to me. Ah, you like our little dream village? Oh, Where is look. it? Nowhere yet. We try year by year. Some years we accomplish more than others. From today's lemons. Thank, Thank you. you. This is where I will live. You have such treasures. Treasures? Oh, certain objects have a spirit of their own. Do you know about Indian spirits? I've heard they're primitive, superstitious beings. Indians? No, the spirits, of course. But I'm beginning to think otherwise. Come. Come see what I've discovered. It's a gate. I haven't discovered if it leads in or out, but it's through that gate that I've seen it. 
seen what? Living evidence. Come in. They want to use the phone. Interesting. An extraordinary place. What? Mrs. E. Dr. Spears. How absolutely delightful. You needn't worry. They're simply very eager. I've seen it with many girls their age. They were here a moment ago. What? Try and be calm, Edward. Carolyn is sharper than you think. What is she doing? Shh. Let's watch. Good heaven. I expect this will be a delightful evening. Ah, oh, Mrs. E, you look lovely. I was just gushing to Elwaz, Dr. Spears. Uh, good evening, Miss Carter. My, what a surprise. Mrs. E, you didn't tell me. You've been in the sun, Doctor. I must say, it suits you. Uh, thank you. Come along, Edward. We must work out the seating for dinner. Miss Carter, you wouldn't mind spending the evening with Dr. Spears, would you? It would be my distinct pleasure. You see, Edward, you must keep Miss Carter company. There's a long evening ahead, and I should think you have much in common. Uh, uh Mrs. E. May I call you Edward? Oh. Uh, Please call me Penelope. Uh, uh. Are you a devotee of art? Edward? Art? I am sometimes carried off my head when I see great beauty. I find that there is something intoxicating about painted scenes, and I feel myself drawn deeply into a reverie. A tendency which I must say is not in my character, but which is quite overpowering in the presence of things so utterly sensual, so free from the constraints of ordinary life. They come from many different minds. Quite a piece of work from a land with no city. Something you don't see every day. You're awfully busy today, Elwaz.
What is going on here? Come in, Edward. Where are the girls? Please, come in, Edward. You know about this? Would it astonish you if I did? What is happening? Let's just say that there are doors around us that lead to other worlds. Come. Do you want to alarm our guests? with us where did he go and where is our hostess do you suppose they're keeping some secret from us tell you all about it it doesn't need to be a secret to be kept from us who would like some lemonade sit here Oscar let me photograph you all right but you must promise to be kinder to me than your colleagues have been how photographers can claim authenticity I'll never know there now let's see the lion in you Drink, drink, drink. <laughs> Edward! Ah, Edward, there you are. Let's go in and sit down to dinner. Edward, look. Uncle Edward! I take it you'll be happy here. I think so. I think we will. Edward, this seems to me a lot of fuss over nothing. Mrs. E tells me the girls were expected here. Is this true? Uh, yes, Oscar. I thought it was to be next week. I was mistaken. Sorry, old fellow. Philip once told me how he perceived the difference between us. He said, Edward, the difference is I am free. Then he left for the war. I never had a chance to prove him wrong. He was wrong. 
that's all. Thank you, Caroline. I suppose it must end here. Perhaps I am leaving things unfinished. Angels have come to live inside me like pigeons in a lost building. I have tried to answer questions and instead I have opened many more. Perhaps these events have created for these characters a future that's impossible for me to see. The words have finished with me for now. The sky is clearing and I am blank from fatigue. The faces recede into the shadows. Mine and not mine. I am not a child. Or two children or any of these. The words dance seductively before me, promising freedom. But then, after taking hold, they turn me around to their own devices, as if they had been waiting with their story for another innocent host, with fingers to command, and time on earth yet unclaimed. I will know later if I am still myself.